Bill Hopler of Industrial Controls, has a BS degree in Electrical Engineering from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. He worked for 13 years as a sales engineer for Honeywell's Process Management Div Division and has worked for Industrial Controls for the last 15 years. Bill teaches customer seminars on flow technology, industrial wireless solutions, and gas detection. So at this time, I'll pass it over to Bill to get us started. Thank you, Jen. Welcome, everyone. So our subject today is why and how to submeter gas, steam, and electric. This time of year, industrial controls usually uh, sets upon a promotion program to remind people that even though we're in the hot weather, that the heating season is around the corner. So we normally promote our flame safeguard products, uh, upgrades to FireEye and Honeywell. This year we took a slightly different approach. Uh, we came out with a brochure uh, that you see here entitled Poor Boiler Room Upgrades. So many of you may have seen the email. Many of you have, may have seen this come in your direct mail. We're seeing a lot of people that recognize that energy costs, high energy costs are here to stay. And in order to be competitive in the marketplace, we all need to focus as, as companies on these upgrades. So we cover four uh, categories in this boiler room upgrade brochure. Uh, optimizing your boilers. In fact, we did a webinar uh, earlier this year on linkage list controls. In fact, you can still find that on our website. We did a webinar last week, hopefully some of you would have attended, uh, that covered VFDs. In fact, I'm doing a job myself right now where we're upgrading controls on a 1400 horsepower boiler to make it more efficient and to save uh, gas usage. And it turns out by putting a VFD on the uh, fan motor saves even more energy and money than the controls upgrade. So we kind of doubled our savings on that job. So VFDs are a critical part of saving, uh, saving energy costs. Uh, steam traps, a lot of people don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to that. We did a webinar on steam traps late last year. You can probably see that, see that on our website. And that takes us today, uh, which is our discussion of submetering gas, uh, electric, and steam. A uh, couple things to note, and that, uh, that is uh, we do have a, a quite a nice website with an online store. Um, you can see a lot of the products that we'll discuss today uh, on our website. You can also look under the training session and see some of the past webinars and some of the future webinars that are planned. And last year we came out with a very nice uh, condensed 1,200 page catalog. Uh, that many of you may already have. Uh, if you don't, you can certainly request one on our website. In addition, you can actually see the uh, ICD catalog online, flip the pages electronically, and it's got a real nice search engine. So if you put in their steam meter, up will come the associated pages that have that, uh, that term, and then click on those pages. It'll take you right to the steam meter section. So pretty nice, pretty nice catalog. So those of you that know us and those that don't, uh, Industrial Controls is leading distributor of HVAC controls, process instrumentation, and valves in North America. We represent over 150 manufacturers. The nice part about that is that we can provide you, uh, in this case, with flow and metering solutions from a number of different suppliers. So we fit you with the right product uh, for the right application uh, to give you the, mo the most return on your investment. The process instrumentation that we have uh, fits really nicely around the boiler. We've got the flow meters. We've got the analytical instruments. Uh, we've got the pressure transmitters. In the month of April, I did a paperless recorder seminar. Last year, I was involved with a gas detection seminar to, to detect natural gas leaks. Uh, full line of valves around the boiler. And of course, the combustion controls, the flame safeguard, Honeywell FireEye, uh, and the control links linkage list devices. So we're, cut, we're not just a distributor, we're a solutions provider. We do the process instrumentation, the valves, as I mentioned, components, gauges, combustion controls, HVAC controls, factory automation, a lot of things in stock, broad selection, 
and we're really good uh, at technical service. For example, if you see something today you're interested in, you call us and say, Bill or one of the people who answers the phone, I need a gas meter. We don't just send you a spec and ask you to pick out the model number. We know the questions to ask and put you in the right manufacturer and the right solution that's going to work best for you. Uh, a lot of online uh, classroom training like we're doing today and a lot of online energy saving tips on our website. So with that, let's get started. This is a picture of a job I worked on last year. Uh, this particular site had 17 boilers uh, in five different locations. These happen to be uh, three of the Cleaver Brooks 400 horsepower, uh, 400 horsepower boilers. And the customer wanted to put the gas meters, and I'll show you in a minute why, uh, why that was, gas meters on these individual boilers. And we took the signals from the gas meter meters into five individual Honeywell paperless recorders. And at the end of each month, that paperless recorder actually sends the gas usage for each of the 17 meters in the five locations to the environmental people that then accumulate that for reporting to the state at the end of the year. So why, why submeter gas, steam, and electric? Uh, first reason is, and that was the motivation on that previous slide, is in New Jersey, the NJDEP three years ago came out with a directive that anyone that had energy producing devices of 20 million BTUs or more was required to do a combustion test at the end of the year and also report the previous year's gas or oil usage. Two years ago, it went to 10,000 BTUs. And in 2010, it went to 5,000. 5,000 is equivalent to about 150 horsepower boiler. I also understand recently we're getting a lot of calls from New York State for gas meters and requests for combustion controls. So I believe that New York may have passed that uh, ordinance also. Again, concept here is to get people to conserve energy, emissions, uh, et cetera. Uh, secondly, we talk about controlling energy costs. And we have a term that a lot of people use, and that is you can't control what you don't measure. So if you don't measure what your, your submetering is, your fuel, your gas, your oil, your steam, it's really difficult to control it. A lot of corporate initiatives out there. In fact, about a month ago, I was with a client here locally in New Jersey, a major pharmaceutical company, and the gentleman gave me his business card. His title was Director of Energy. That's how important that energy conservation was to this particular company. So he's the worldwide director for energy conservation uh, globally for his company. Obviously, companies want to reduce energy costs to remain competitive in the world market. And of course, there's a lot of uh, focus on uh, being green and sustainable energy coal, uh, goals that a lot of companies now have. So lower building operating costs. This is a slide I took from one of our manufacturers. And their analysis indicates that apparently 20 to 30 percent of a building's operating budget is the actual energy that it consumes. And it's interesting that when people announce that they've got a program in place to start looking at energy usage, uh, it, it's been found that about they see a 2 percent decrease just because the tenants uh, know that energy is being looked at, they have a more tendency to turn off the lights and, and, and not keep things on and running when they're not needed. And then when energy bills are used, there's another 5% decrease. And overall, the industry seems to say that submetering uh, potentially saves an average of 17% on an ongoing basis with tenant cons conservation efforts as a result of submetering. So these things can produce a uh, submeter can produce a lower demand, a lower footprint, uh, lower emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot, of, a lot of benefits out there, and there are a lot of uh, affordable solutions that we're going to talk about. So what resources can you submeter? We're kind of going to focus around the boiler room, but these can be applied to other areas outside the boiler room. But the logical ones are natural gas, fuel oil, steam, electric water, and compressed air. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, submeter of natural gas. And that's not just boilers. The job we did uh, with those 17 gas meters, some of those energy users 
for hot water heaters. There's some pretty large hot water heaters out there, rooftop units, um, and uh, multiple clients. Uh, we're seeing a lot of places, at least in New Jersey, where there were big manufacturing plants, and they've kind of been cut up into different tenants, but the main uh, steam plant and gas generating plant is still standalone, and we're getting more and more requests to submeter that gas out to the different clients so that that can be billed as part of their, uh, their rents. So some of the challenges in picking a gas meter, uh, rangeability, definition of rangeability is what's the ratio between the highest flow I can measure and the lowest flow. You might be surprised to find that some of the meters out there only have a range of three to one. So in the case of natural gas, when you see a difference in winter, summer uh, consumption, you're going to need a rangeability much higher than three to one. You've got pressure changes, so some flow meters don't compensate for minor pressure changes in the gas pressure coming from the street. Uh, selecting the right technology, you want to make sure you get something that's uh, low maintenance if possible, uh, fewer moving parts, uh, and one that, that meets the needs of the site both short term and long term. And lastly, if you really want to do the, the sub-metering thing, which is actually e easier today than it used to be, is you want to make sure you pick the gas meter with the output signals so that that information can be taken up, archived, recorded, and uh, theoretically then billed to the individual clients. So you want to make sure you pick a flow meter that has some outputs that are capable of providing this. So interesting, the traditional approach by a lot of big companies and you'll still find a, a, a dominant installation out there for measuring gas has been the orifice plate. And all that is basically is you put a restriction in a gas line, a differential pressure is created across that, strict, that restriction. You measure with a DP pressure transmitter, and that's proportional to the square of the flow rate. And then you've got the piping that you have to put in, the low side and the high side to a transmitter. And if there are pressure and temperature changes, then you've got to compensate and do your PV over T calculation, which means you need a flow computer. All this is nonlinear and gives you a rangeability. Some people say four to one, some people say three to one. In fact, I have customers today that are looking at submetering, and right now they have orifice plates, and between winter and summer, they put in a different orifice plate. Because if an orifice plate can only do three to one at the high demand, they won't be able to measure low demand. So they put a plate in with a bigger restriction so they can measure flow rates in the summertime than the wintertime. So pretty interesting. A lot, lot of systems out there still like this. So what's the new way to do it? Well, a new way, there's a couple different technologies, both of which we have. One is called thermal dispersion. And what that does is there are two RTVs in the insertion part of the meter, upstream and downstream. The downstream is the reference. The upstream is heated by microamps. And the velocity of the flow and the heat it takes away from the upstream RTV is measured in a circuit. And that's proportional to flow rate. So you're getting your PV over T calculation right in one sensor. And it's got a very nice uh, insertion application where you can put in a thread outlet and a ball valve. So you can put the uh, flow meter in hot. So a lot of people put the, uh, the, the tap in before they get the meter. So they don't have to shut the meter down in order to install it. Uh, there are no moving parts. And you can measure SCFM, SCFH, or actually BTUs. And you've got nice outputs. You've got 4 to 20 pulse and uh, even Modbus. Another popular technology out there for measuring gas is a vortex meter. It's got a range ability of about 20 to 1. Again, no moving parts. And there are brands that we have out there that do either provide pressure or temperature compensation. So you don't need, need that flow calculator that I had put uh, up on a previous slide. The important thing is to size the meter properly. So uh, we've got many sizing programs for the vortex and for the gas meter. So if you give us the flow data line size, BTUs, we know all the questions to ask. In fact, we even have a form. If you fill that out or just call us on the phone, we'll put that into our calculation and make sure we pick the right 
flowmeter for your application. Down below you'll notice if you do have a catalog or you do request it or you go online, the thermal dispersion meter is on ICD catalog page 333 and the vortex is on page 336. Now there are a lot of boilers out there that are small and we have a lot of people that want a submeter but they don't necessarily want to hook that to the building management system. So there are still good affordable uh, updated mechanical meters that don't require a lot of maintenance. There are two types. There's turbine and uh, diaphragm meters. The diaphragm meters are for the much lower pressure and below about 800,000 BTUs. The diaphragm meter might be a better choice. Get higher than that, a turbine is probably better. And even the turbines and the diaphragm meter have pulse output options, so that's something that could be bought now for future use or added at a later date. If you decide to submeter, take your readings manually, and then go to a building management system, you can always add that feature. So uh, we're pretty good at putting you into the right meter. So another popular uh, fuel that's metered, a lot of people still use oil on their boilers. I've uh, seen a lot of people that have dual fuels, so they switch depending on their contract with a natural gas company. And the typical uh, fuels that are being used are number two, number four, number six. Many people get away from number six because of environmental things, but again, the same challenges as natural gas rangeability, select the right technology, highly recommend strainers, especially in the dirtier oils. Time and time again, we've heard people say, oh, my oil's clean, and then they call up and they find the lines are clogged, so uh, please invest in a strainer if you're going to do fuel oil. Uh, some of the meters have uh, moving parts, so there might be some maintenance there. And pretty much all the meters today that we work with have output signals that can be used up to data acquisition systems. So the two uh, or three technologies that we use for fuel oil are the turbine oval gear, me gear meters. And these are volumetric. So they measure gallons, not pounds, and I'll talk about that in a second. So uh, if you look at our catalog page 321, you'll see a nice turbine meter that you can get this battery operated if you don't want to connect to a building management system. Or you can get a pulse output or 4 to 20, remote display, a lot of choices there. Uh, there's also an oval gear meter. Why would you use one over the other? Typically, uh, with the cleaner oils and lower viscosities, uh, we use the turbine meter. For the higher viscosities, we use the oval gear. They have the same uh, outputs for a 20 and pulse. And there are some people that want to much more accurately measure their fuel oil. So there is a technology called Coriolis that actually measures the pounds. So if the specific gravity of your number six fuel oil, for example, changes from time to time with temperature, which it does, the Coriolis meter will actually measure the pounds of oil that are going to your boiler, not just the volumetric. So you know, expensive application, but nonetheless, one that's out there, it's on page 320 on the catalog, and the oval gear meters are on 319. So let's move over into steam. This might be the most difficult one uh, because there's a few more challenges involved with steam. The thing that I've found over the years I've been doing this is steam lines out of boilers are always oversized. Uh, and it's hard to find the estimated flow rates in order to size the flow meter. In fact, when I ask people when they call in or I see them in person about what, what the flow rate is, their answer is, Bill, that's why I want a flow meter. If I knew the flow rate, I wouldn't need a flow meter, which I, I guess is kind of true. So there are a couple of uh, tricks of the trade you can use. One is you can take the boiler size and calculate the efficiency, which we find is about 50%. So if you turn uh, horsepower BTUs into steam, it's about 50%. The maximum steam output from boilers is about 50% of what the boiler is capable of producing heat-wise. That's one way of doing it. Uh, boiler pressure does vary, so you're going to see pressure temperature compensations. Uh, most people use saturated steam, although uh, the utilities use superheated steam. And think about it, 100 PSI of saturated steam, that's 405 degrees Fahrenheit. So you've got to be really careful about the flow meter you put in. 
and some of them in there have fittings and piping. So you've got to be sure that, that, uh, that the fitting and the piping is secured uh, because 405 degrees steam leaking in your powerhouse is not a pleasant situation. So again, the traditional approach uh, that I've seen people do on steam in the past has been the same as gas, and that is the orifice plate. The only difference is you mount the differential pressure transmitter below the uh, paddle wheel orifice plate because you want the condensate from the steam to accumulate in what's called the wet legs. So that way you um, separate the transmitter because most transmitters today aren't capable of seeing 400 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll fry the diaphragm. So if you fill those legs with condensate, then you are protecting the transmitter. Then you've got piping, you've got installation, you've got maintenance associated with that. You've got a pressure transmitter to do the pressure temperature pressure compensation, temperature uh, flow computer like we discussed before, and you wind up with three to one. And I know major utilities in the state of New Jersey that still use orifice plates, and I'm telling you, they have a winter and a summer orifice plate. So what's the new way? Uh, the new way is uh, one example is or one technology is vortex meter, just like gas. And in fact, uh, Con Edison in the city, New York City, that's what they use exclusively uh, to do steam uh, allocation to their clients in the city. But uh, you've got no moving parts, and the vortex shutter itself is pretty simple. It's a bluff body that goes in the steam pipe, inserted in the steam pipe, and the flow of steam creates a slight deflection on that shutter bar, and there are vortices created downstream that create those deflections, and the pulsing of those deflections is proportional to the flow rate. And the other nice part about it is there are manufacturers that have a way to, in the same meter body, compensate for either pressure or temperature, so you get your true PV over T calculation, and then your outputs can be either 4 to 20, uh, or pulse to a recorder building management system, or DCS. These are in our catalog, page 336. Uh, there are other technologies that can be used. Uh, these are what we call differential pressure. And I said earlier about uh, trying to guess what the steam rates are. I did a job about a year ago where a, a big plant uh, kept their boiler plant but put in several tenants that were consuming steam. So they had a double problem. One, the header outside the boiler was oversized. And number two, they really did not have a clue of the flow rates on the other pipes going out to the different users. So what we did was we suggested a reduced throat venturi, which is a way of reducing that differential pressure. And we sized it in such a way so that it was mid-range in a differential pressure transmitter that we used. So we didn't have to change pressure transmitters or venturis between winter and summer. And it turned out to be a nice application. Uh, and we're getting 15 to 1 rangeability. And they're sending that back to a building management system. There's another technology called V-Cone, uh, which is also differential pressure that we use on steam, which can get you a rangeability of also 15 to 1. So couple, two or three different choices, depends on the situation and the application, and uh, the V-Cone is on uh, ICD catalog page 342. So let's talk about uh, electric distribution. So a lot of companies don't allocate costs by square feet, but a lot of building owners, universities allocate it, uh, they do allocate it by square feet. So uh, something called the Hawthorne effect, I don't know where that came from, but it's simple. I used to do a lot of travel in my Honeywell days, and when I got to my hotel room, first thing I did, turn on the lights, turn on the AC, turn on the TV, uh, turn on the bathroom light, and when I left to go for a cup of coffee, guess what? I didn't turn a lot of those things off. So I was a high energy user even though I wasn't there. Now those of you that have traveled to Europe know that in their hotel rooms for the most part, They've got a key that when you leave the hotel room and take the key, you, in effect, shut off all the power uh, to that room. So my point is that for people that allocate costs by square feet, that's probably not fair. And customers, the tenants don't pay too much attention to their allocation because they know it's spread by other people. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there to 
look at electric submeter distribution. So everybody's seen the typical power meter that you have at your house or uh, your office building or your plant or your commercial building. So what a lot of people are doing is the first step they're doing is they're putting in what's called a shadow meter. So they put in their own meter next to the PSENG meter and they connect that to a BMS or a PC so they can keep an idea and grab a trend and see what their electric usage rates are day, night, weekend, summer, winter, etc. So that, that's a great place to start. Um, the boiler job that I mentioned that we're doing, uh, they asked us to put in a, an electric meter to actually monitor and accumulate and trend the power that's being used by the VFD that we put in so that they can document the savings so that they can put those on other boilers in their plant. But there are electric distribution uh, meters out there that work on all different powers, uh, all, uh, mostly pretty much exclusively three, uh, three wire and three phase. And the good part is you can get just a local meter with a display with no outputs, or you can get a meter with outputs and also connections such as Modbus RTU, BACnet, LawnWorks, and then these things can be hooked to your building management system or to your plant network. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about putting in a PC with software or a BMS in a little while. There are also versions that where you have a really output, so you can set a set point like you do on a, uh, a flow controller or a temperature controller. And when your demand goes above a certain rate, which could be your peak demand, which is in the contract from your electric company, you can get a warning so things can be done to shut devices off so you don't go over that peak. And I'm sure pretty much everyone on the phone knows that everyone's electric contract has a peak demand function in there. So if you go above the peak demand that you agreed to in your contract for one minute, you are now billed for that peak demand usage, which is much, much higher per, per, per kilowatt wire, per kilowatt hour, than you would on your normal contracts. And there's a tremendous penalty there. So you knowing in your plant by using electric distribution what that trend is. And if you're getting close to that peak, there are things you can do from the data acquisition system that will allow you to make some adjustments so that you don't hit that peak. So here's a picture of some of the graphics that are available on some of the programs that can be used uh, with electric meters. So once they're installed, most people have plant networks. So you can bring this into your existing building management system. If you don't have a BMS uh, and you have PCs on the network, you can buy some relatively inexpensive software that runs on a PC. So you can monitor, control, and actually produce tenant monthly bills like this one on my slide that's a, uh, a meter billing statement. The ultimate, of course, is if you have a BMS or a DCS, by bringing in all this sub-metering, not just the electrical, but also the, uh, the steam and the gas, and the water and compressed air, uh, you can do trending, you can do billing, you can do utility uh, penalty alarming, you can uh, turn things off like compressors or air handlers or chillers that are not being used, so you go, don't go over that peak load. Uh, and you put in some pretty fancy demand response programs. So beyond the scope of our discussion today, that's kind of, you know, painting the uh, ultimate big picture. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, water. I mean, water usage is critical. I know in South Jersey, uh, there's uh, significant increases in uh, residential water rates. So a lot of people are looking at also metering water. So there's technologies out there. Uh, most simple are... Uh, paddle wheels that are inexpensive. They have digital outputs and displays, so you can actually sub-meter uh, your water. In fact, I was at a site in Manhattan yesterday where there were 40 co-op apartments, you know, old-time 1900s that were renovated. You know, we're talking fairly high-ticket uh, co-ops, and they were trying to figure a way to sub-meter all that, so they put in some uh, a building management system, and they put in BTU meters. So each of those apartments now has a turbine meter, 
that measures the flow of the uh, inbound water that goes to each apartment and the outbound water with two temperature sensors uh, that get fed back to a, um, con a, uh, compu a controller, basically. So you got two temperatures and a flow that calculates BTUs. That's sent via line works to a Honeywell Tritium BMS system, and that's how all the tenants get built. So as I said earlier, the cool part about that is that people can conserve their own energy instead of having to worry about the guy next door keeping his heat on high during the winter and not worrying so much because the other 39 tenants are going to chip in on the overall bill. So some of these products are on ICD catalog pages uh, 304 through 311. Uh, compressed air. Uh, I'm told by people that that's one of the heaviest users in industrial plants. There's still an awful lot of valves out there that are pneumatic, even though electric is taking over in some areas. And leaks can be really significant. So by putting in uh, sub-metering, using a similar meter to the one we talked about uh, on the natural gas with a high range ability, 100 to 1. Uh, you can identify leaks, potentially run fewer compressors, which is going to save you elect, uh, electric. And then you can monitor and actually bill the individual, individual departments for their compressed air usage. So another idea for submetering. So, all right. So I've got all these nice submetering uh, capabilities, uh, a lot of things that we can do. Uh, a lot of people can just go out and make uh, local readings of these meters. But I think with the technology that's out there and the networks that are available today, the smart thing to do is to take that data into, for example, a paperless recorder, like we did on that uh, 17 gas meter job. So the paperless recorder can give the local boiler operator guys they can see what the gas usage is. They can see the trends. They can also create that report and send it to the energy people uh, each month. Um, the output of the recorder can also interface, be put on the network, and be sent up to their existing building management system. The uh, reason we put in paperless recorders on that one application was they didn't want to go through any reprogramming of the building management system. They thought that the paperless recorder was a more a cost-effective approach for that customer. A lot of SCADA software packages. Uh, there are some nice inexpensive PC software packages for electric and steam distribution. Uh, GE, who we represent, uh, has a package called Simplicity, iFix, Honeywell's got a data acquisition called SpecView, and of course many of you out there have existing building management systems. So that would be the way to go is to bring all that data into your you know, put remote I.O. out there and bring that back to your um, existing building management system. And don't forget about wireless. Now, a lot of plants that we see out there have networks, and it's an easy thing to connect onto the network, these sub-metering meters or paperless recorders. But there still are some locations that are uh, remote, remote buildings, for example, that may not have networks, or even buildings where there may not be networks uh, at the far reach of the building. So we've got a number of technologies, uh, both industrial wireless and Wi-Fi, that we've had some good success with. Uh, we do a lot of surveys to make sure we get good reception, but that's a way to make sub-metering much more affordable. So uh, with that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our new enhanced website. Uh, I encourage you to go on there. We find a lot of people uh, give us the feedback that they use that as a resource. For example, if they're looking for a flow meter, uh, they'll go on in our search engine, and some of the ones we talked about will come up today so that they get an idea of what's possible out there. And then all they need to do is pick up the phone, uh, send us the application form uh, that we have for flow, uh, or just call us and talk to one of our people. Our people know the questions to ask and we'll be able to get you in the right, uh, the right cost-effective meter that gives you the best return on investment. So we've got a lot of product pricing up there, um, complete library of specs, a lot of case studies, technical tips, uh, white papers. In fact, I think there's one up there on compressed air. 
can do a literature request, request a catalog, look at the virtual catalog. Uh, we run some specials. We have a chat line, see our training videos, webinars, and we do have a 24-7 emergency phone number. Uh, that we've actually uh, had people come to the office on Christmas time, open up the warehouse, and get a valve for someone uh, because the heating system was down. So. A lot, of, a lot of capabilities and a lot of resources inside our company. So uh, our new catalog, 1,200 pages, we couldn't fit everything in it. But we're finding more and more that a lot of people like to have a catalog just to breeze through. If they see something interesting, they'll go on the website or call us at that 800 number. Uh, it's got over 100,000 products, part number index in the back, in the back, the manufacturer's index, selection charts, specifications, uh, and photos. So really. Uh, we did a really nice job in this catalog, and I hope that uh, you all take advantage of it. So with that, uh, this is my contact information. Uh, Jen will be sending out uh, a message afterwards if you want to contact us, uh, have an engineer call, uh, get a quote, have us send you the PowerPoint presentation, have us send you the uh, a flow form to fill out that we can run through our calculation programs. So uh, that's my contact information. Please feel free to email me uh, or give me a call. Uh, with that, Jen, I'd like to open it up to questions. OK, thanks, Bill. Um, we did receive a few questions in through the chat. Um, the first question came in from Dennis. And he asks, would these meters work in direct steam line, or is this a hot water application? Uh, yeah, Dennis, they, they would work in both. I think he might be referring to some boilers generate hot water and some boilers generate steam. So for the steam, we would talk and use the technologies we talked about, the, uh, the vortex meter, for example. When it came down to uh, hot water, we probably have other technologies, other technologies that uh, might be a better fit, although that same vortex meter could also be used on hot water. Yeah, so for hot water and steam, uh, we can do both, and they both add the outputs of 4 to 20 uh, and pulsing. hope that answers your question, Dennis. OK, thanks. Um, another question in from Joe. He asks, for the wireless system, does that connect to the current network in a building, or does it have to have its own network? Uh, that can be done both ways. The, we have a number of technologies, one of which actually can take a Let's pick paperless recorder as an example. So if I had a paperless recorder a thousand feet away and I didn't want to wire it to my network, I could take the Ethernet port on that paperless recorder. I could send that wires wirelessly from a wireless transmitter to a wireless receiver, Ethernet wireless receiver, that was closer to a network connection, hook it on my network and then see that on my building management system or DCS like I would any other device in the plant. So yeah, you, you can do that uh, without having to have a separate network. OK, great. Um, another question in from Jim. He asks, what information do I need to provide you with to get a quote on a gas meter? OK, good question. Um, first thing we need to know is line size pipe material, schedule, um, and pressure, what, what the gas pressure is. That will help us pick the right meter. And then, which is usually pretty easy to get, is the BTU, the max, the BTUs per hour, million BTUs per hour off the final device, the boiler, the hot water heater, uh, the rooftop unit, et cetera. So if we have the BTUs, the line size, uh, and the pressure of pipe material, and then what you want in the way of an output, pulse, uh, 4 to 20, or mod bus, that list of things would give us enough to point you in the right technology and get you a quotation. OK, great. Uh, another question in from Tony. He asks, can I get local displays on, a, on steam and oil meters? OK, good question. All the flow meters that we talked about today have the capability of integral displays actually on the meter, although in some cases that's not convenient because meters sometimes are elevated in the powerhouse. So uh, all those same meters 
have the capability of a remote display that connects with the cable to the actual flow meter so you can see the display on the wall and then from that display electronics get sent out the Modbus, the 4 to 20, uh, or the Pulse. Good question. Okay. Another question in from Ron. He asks, can a paperless recorder interface with by existing building management system? Uh, yeah, in fact, that job I talked about, those 17 gas meters, uh, that's what they're planning to do in the future. It interface to their network just to send email this report to the environmental people, but from your building management system network or from your DCS, the Ethernet uh, port on the paperless recorder and other e Ethernet devices for that matter, uh, using Modbus TCP IP, all the Modbus TCP IP addresses of the individual parameters that are in the recorder, the flow rates, the totals, are Modbus addresses. So from your building management system, you can look at the IP address of the paperless recorder and the Modbus addresses of each of those parameters that you want to fetch. And then you'll be able to upload those periodically to your building management system, uh, trend, totalize, and invoice as we discussed. So yes, it's a very easy thing to interface a, a paperless recorder to an existing building management system. OK, great. Um, actually, another question came in from Joe. Are the gas meters capable of metering gases such as nitrogen and carbon dioxide? Uh, they absolutely are. I just We just covered today only natural gas just because we were focusing around the boiler. But yeah, any, any compressible gas out there, inert gases, um, hydrogen, ammonia, any, any compressible gas. And what happens there is we take that data as we do with the natural gas data, and we tell the manufacturer of the thermal dispersion meter what the gas is, and they calibrate it for that particular gas. So you wind up with the same thing, a thermal dispersion, uh, dispersion device that does the pressure temperature compensation on nitrogen, for example, with the same 4 to 20 uh, output pulse or mod bus. So yeah, good question. That thermal dispersion can be used on any dry gas. OK, thanks. Um, so with that being said, I think we're going we're gonna to stop um, and the presentation there. Um, if you missed any part of today's um, session, we will post a recorded version on our website, uh, which is industrialcontrolsonline.com. So within the next couple of days, um, we're going to email you a link to the video and our contact information if you have any further questions or feedback for uh, future webinars. Um, I just sent you a survey link through the chat feature on your control panel. So we would greatly appreciate it if you would fill out the survey, let us know what you thought about today's presentation, and if you can provide us um, with any uh, suggestions for future webinar topics uh, that you all might be interested in. So thank you for attending, and we look forward to having you back um, in our future webinars.